I'd like to take the opportunity to thank the At The Limits team for making this happen. Um, I've been involved with this particular meeting from the beginning. And uh, for, you, for those of you who don't know, um, the feedback from this meeting is the best feedback I've ever seen for an academic meeting around MS or MS-related disorders. And I think the reason is, is the format and uh, the fact that there are no parallel sessions. We have ample time for discussion. It all works very well. And it's also the quality of the speakers. So I'm, I'm really, you know, we're very grateful to have uh, Jeff Bennett from Colorado coming out. Jeff's extremely well known in the field, and he's been chasing the antigen specificity of oligoclonal bands uh, in MS, you know, your whole academic career. <laughs> and, and I think, um, you know, we've always hypothesised, you know, that if we could find out what the antigen specificity is, we will um, crack what the cause of multiple sclerosis is. So I'm not going to say anything else, Jeff. Welcome, and thank you for making the effort of coming across the ocean. Well, good morning, afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers uh, to, uh, for their kind invitation to, stalk, to talk here and the ability to travel, to finally have a holiday in the past 18 months. And after traveling across the ocean, I must say, I felt right at home. <laughs> it's just like I was back in America. So, <laughs> I was tasked with addressing what is the target of the oligoclonal bands. And I think that if I'm successful, I will impress on you that the real question is what are the targets of the oligoclonal bands in MS? Part of that comes from both the noise in the system as well as the fact that what we, in my opinion, officially call multiple sclerosis is not a homogeneous group of disorders. So, how am I going to break down this talk? I'm going to break it down into three parts. The why, the what, and the where. The why being why do we care what the target of the oligoclonal bands are? What have we done so far to identify those targets? And finally, where are we going from this point forward? So it was overabundance of CSF IgG that was first noted, as you heard previously, by Henry Cabot and colleagues now 80 years ago where the overabundance of IgG a decade later was noticed to have intrathecal synthesis by comparison to protein levels in the CSF and in the blood. And that difference allowed us to come up with terminology that we still use to date with the IgG index as a measure of that intrathecal synthesis. And subsequently, a decade after that, with the development of electrophoretic techniques, we could find that this immunoglobulin was separable into bands of paired heavy and light chain divalent immunoglobulins. This CSF oligoclonal bands, while not specific to MS, is found in all phases of the disease and in the vast majority of MS patients and is currently used in our 2017 criteria to determine dissemination in time and that's because it is a product of time and large quantity production of CSF immunoglobulin and also correlates with some indices of prognosis in multiple sclerosis. Dr. Calabresi and colleagues looked at patients with oligoclonal bands and without oligoclonal bands in multiple sclerosis and found out that those with oligoclonal bands had higher levels of lymphoneogenic and inflammatory cytokines. They had evidence of increased tissue injury as measured by cortical lesion load as well as serum measures of cortical damage, such as neurofilament light, and increased incidence of functional impairment as an increased risk for progressive disease. But even more importantly, in other disorders where there are oligoclonal IgGs in the CNS, specifically in infectious causes, both in human, in blue, animal, and gold, the target of the oligoclonal IgGs is the causative organism of the infection. And so therefore, why study oligoclonal bands? 
Because oligoclonal bands are a frequent feature of multiple sclerosis patient CSF that's associated with disease activity in some way that it is either directly pathogenic or driven by the process that is driving inflammatory pathogenesis. And it's going to inform us of the immune targets in this disorder. So to put it simply, as the famous bank robber did in the US, Willie Sutton, when asked why do you rob banks, he said that's where the money is. So why study oligoclonal bands? Because that's where the money is. Early studies of oligoclonal band specificity were challenged technically. How do you take this polyclonal CSF IgG and determine what fraction is specifically the oligoclonal fraction? People use relative comparison of CSF and serum in their binding assays, or they use immunoaffinity gels and electrophoretic techniques, and they came up with a multiple target specificities, including viral and oligodendrocyte and intracellular and neuronal targets. And some of these likely are some projects of some IgG that are made intrathecally as some components of the oligoclonal bands. Which one by these methods? It's hard to say. What we decided to do now 20 years ago in collaboration with the late Don Gilden and with my longstanding scientific colleague Greg Owens, we went to look at a novel approach to specifically study the human oligoclonal bands by reproducing them in the laboratories. And the bottom figure shows that if you take CSF cells, B cells, culture them, and run them electrophoretically on a gel against the patient's own cerebral spinal fluid, you can see that those B cells, when stimulated, produce most, but not all, of the oligoclonal bands. So it was our strategy to recover antibody-secreting B cells, plasma blasts, plasma cells from the CSF, clone and analyze their structure, and produce recombinant antibodies in tissue culture that duplicate their antigen specificity. How we did that was by using facts to sort antibody-producing plasma cells here from MSCSF to isolate them as single cells in a dish, use RT-PCR to find paired heavy and light chains from individual cells, identify those cells that were clonally expanded by virtue of multiple B cells expressing the same clonally related immunoglobulin pairs, and produce their antibodies in vitro. The cells that we found showed targets of an antigen-driven process and a dynamic circulation between the blood and the cerebral spinal fluid. In particular, they showed restrictive B cell repertoires that showed somatic hypermutation, indicative of a germinal center reaction. Our group and others have shown that those germinal center reactions are proceeding both in the nervous system and outside the nervous system and readily interchanging between those two compartments both at established stages of diseases, at the earliest stages of diseases, and within tissue, within the disease. Antibodies from these plasma cells through the work of Brigitte Obermeier, Klaus Dormeier, and Hans Christian von Budingen showed in elegant techniques using proteomics, transcriptomics, anti-idiotypic antibodies, that the recombinant antibodies produced by these repertoires of B cells from the CSF connect directly with these oligoclonal bands. Well, how does this work in particular? We focused first on some diseases where we know what the target is, both with and without oligoclonal bands. In the first, we use subsclerosing panencephalitis a lethal measles virus infection that, paradoxically, is one of the reasons why we vaccinate against measles virus is the horrible endpoint of this disorder and this brain infection. And we found in a patient with subacute sclerosing panencephalitis that clonal populations of B cells within the central nervous system 
had an antigen target response with a VH1 germline bias, and 70% of those plasma cells, not 100%, 70% of them were directed against measles virus protein. In neuromyelitis optica, where we don't typically find a pronounced intrathecal large-scale synthesis of immunoglobulins, still, during an attack, we find clonally expanded populations of cells with targeted clonal populations with a VH2 germline bias directed against the aquaporin-4 water channel. And again, here, interestingly enough, roughly 70% of those plasma cells were targeted against the aquaporin-4 water channel. And through analysis transcriptomically, proteomically, we know that there are clones within this intrathecal space that are not produced within the peripheral blood. So there's essentially noise within the system. When we went to focus on MSF, MSCSF, one of the things we noticed in particular was that how you looked for things made quite a difference. If we took standard immunoglobulin against measles virus and stained measles virus brain, we took an anti-myelin antibody and stained MS lesions, we could readily establish signaling in formal and fixed tissue. However, if we took a recombinant antibody that we had cloned against, uh, in this case had cloned from a mouse against MOG, or we took one that we had cloned from an MS patient, or one of the antibodies that we had cloned against measles virus from a patient, they would not readily recognize formal and fixed tissue. So most MS antibody staining is negative, very weakly staining in fixed tissue, and that's because in MSCSF and in aquaporin-4, neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder, where we clone antibodies from patients, we have found that if you look at a commercial antibody, readily evident against denatured aquaporin-4 protein in terms of binding on a gel. However, all of these antibodies are conformationally dependent. They essentially bind to orthogonal arrays of particles, and they do not bind to non-conformational targets. And in this case, while these antibodies are made by patients and can be used in ELISA assays to say yes, no disease, these antibodies are not pathogenic when used in human assays or tissue assays. So not only does it matter what you're looking for, but it matters how you're going to go back looking for it. And again, I'll point to the fact that there are lots of candidates for MS antigens, and some of them may all look alike. And there are multiple processes for looking for these antigens, and some of these processes will inherently bias what you find. And so when it comes to targets, you can look at myelin targets, you can look at neuronal targets, you can look at lipid targets, and you can look for exogenous targets. And when it comes to processes, you can look by assays such as ELISA, Western blot, immunohistology, but you're going to be hampered by looking for targets that are essentially going to be bound in their denatured state. You can look by cell binding assays where you can cover whether you're looking at natured live cell binding or whether you're looking at denatured fixed cells. And you can look at protein and phage display that sometimes have some conformational targets, but they're usually of low complexity. And what you look for is essentially what you get. And that's where we can look at what we've accomplished to date in a lovely paper uh, by Klaus Dormer and colleagues. You can see that when they looked at CSF oligoclonal bands, now reconstructed as recombinant antibodies using proteomics from the actual bands to get clips of the heavy and light chain, matched with full sequence from whole transcriptomics from the same patient, they found both some by ELISA anti-EBV targets, they found some intracellular targets from kinases and cell signaling members. But the issue with this is that while it probably is some valid specificities of the oligoclonal bands, some things are going to drive it. 
how they looked for it, looking for denatured targets by immunoblots, how you look for it in a protoarray while it is a broad spectrum analysis, the protoarray while it has some larger domains that may be conformational, if we used a protoarray to look for aquaporin-4 antibodies from recombinants we derive from patients, we wouldn't find one antibody that bound to this protoarray, no matter how many segments of aquaporin-4 you fell down. So complex epitopes are going to be missed in such an assay. And finally, when you look at reconstructing antibodies by proteomic methods, you're not necessarily looking for the most robust immune response as you can from single cells that you're isolating from the CSF that have become abundantly clonal, and that's evident by your analysis process by facts. In fact, we did a similar analysis with Hugh Willison and colleagues looking at glycolipid binding in an array, and we found that almost a third of our multiple sclerosis recombinant antibody bound to glycolipidides, particularly sulfatide and sulfatide complexes. However, in contrary, if you look at CSF immunoglobulins recombinant antibodies made from inflammatory controls, you found about a third of them bound to CSF, sulfatide, and lipid complexes because probably for three things. Some of these are legitimate lipid targets, possibly from damage and associated immune response. Some of them may bind non-discreetly to these antibodies because many autoantibodies have a significant positive charge in their CDR3 domains. And finally, because these lipid complexes may be a part of a more complex antigenic target. So what are we doing now and where are we going? This is what I want to focus on in particular, and a lot of this work is done by uh, my longstanding colleague, Greg Owens, who has tired, worked tirelessly on this for the past uh, 20 years. And as we published now almost six years ago, when we look at our spectrum of recombinant antibodies cloned from MSCSF patients, we find that they break, break down into basically two categories, those that bind to neuronal and astrocytic targets, and they compose about two-thirds of these. And in this case, we use unfixed tissue and live cell binding to cultures to identify these conformational targets. And about a third of them bind to myelin targets. And in this case, you can see them nicely binding to mouse cerebellum here or to live differentiating rat CG4 cells at various stages of oligodendrocyte differentiation. So which one of these to concentrate on first? Well, part of which is we thought the best first step was to look at a functional stage. And that is we looked at these antibodies. This is a neuronal, myelin, and astrocytic targeted recombinant antibodies. These are control antibodies, measles virus antibody, another second control antibody in spinal cord slices, showing that if we look at them in the presence of human complement, control antibodies do not cause spinal cord destruction, but both the astrocytic, neuronal, and the oligodendrocyte targeted recombinant antibodies cause damage. So it didn't quite help us to decide which ones to focus on first, and this is shown graphically here. But how we decided to go after myelin targets first was obviously it would be more believable to everyone out here. You know, nowadays we can all accept that perhaps it doesn't have to be a myelin target in multiple sclerosis, but given the astrocytic target in neuromyelitis optica, but we'll start with myelin here. And so this myelin target on a live cell binding assay with super resolution microscopy can show you that this target stained in red with the human recombinant antibody is pumped through the connections from the oligodendrocyte stained with EGFP here intrinsically in green over a mag neurofilament staining in purple, mag in blue, and mog out here in blue on the side. And these are discrete packets on the extracellular surface of the myelin uh, sheath pumped out along these little 
connections from the oligodendrocyte to adjacent neurons. And so I'm going to show you what these antibodies can do pathogenically in the next few slides. And these MS recombinant antibodies I'm going to show you in cerebellar slice models and in microinjection models. And in these two models, these mice are expressing EGFP using the PLP promoter as a transgenic, so all of their oligos are nice and green here for you. So in this question, do these cause cell death, demyelination, axonal damage, or do they affect repair? So in the SLICE model, we've previously published that this MS antibody, just like a aquaporin-4 targeted antibody from neuromyelitis optica, can cause demyelination in the presence of human complement. Here is an isotype control antibody, and here is the quantitation of that demyelination and the absence of any demyelination with antibody alone in the absence of any exogenous source of human complement. These MS targeting antibodies against myelin do not affect oligodendrocyte integrity as shown here. And with the presence of an aquaporin-4 antibody, you can see the destruction that's ensuing within uh, astrocytes. Neurons are, do not have any damage in the slice model with the MS antibody. However, they do get damaged with the presence of an aquaporin-4 neuromyelitis optica antibody. So these antibodies are capable of activating complement and causing demyelination in slice cultures. And interestingly, these demyelination models, when left to recover, that is exposed for 48 hours, the complement and antibody are washed off, these lesions do repair nicely, as opposed to those caused by aquaporin-4 antibodies. This is an isotype control showing you, as are stained here, myelin basic protein stain on top of neurofilament in blue, showing you the loss of myelin and then the reconstitution. What we've subsequently come to look at is that this myelin antibody, in the absence of complement and independent of a functional FCN, which I don't have time to show you here, impair recovery of myelination. So if you demyelinate for 48 hours, then exposed to antibody without the presence of human complement, you'll find that you can inhibit repair of myelin, which is shown here in this rightward two sets, as opposed to the nice remyelination that comes along in the absence. So these antibodies, while they may promote destruction, also their presence in the absence of complement may impair recovery. And that's something that we should be looking at in our human patients who have these antibodies. And it may explain why ant remyelination therapies have so much trouble, is that you don't have to just promote repair, because if we add any of those agents in this model, they repair nicely and can promote repair nicely. If we add pro-remyelinating agents to this model with the continued presence of antibody there, they don't remyelinate at all. So you have a block to remyelination. If we look in the intact organism where we have an intact immune system present and we inject antimyelin antibodies without complement and with complement, with complement, we see that we have nice, robust, destructive lesions characterized by a loss of oligodendrocytes, an infiltration of um, macrophages and microglia into the lesion, as well as, and I don't have time to show you, nice lesions of axons and uh, destruction of neurons in the adjacent area. In the absence of complement or with antibody alone, we don't get those destructive lesions. What is this target? We do know what it is, but unfortunately I can't give you a name right now. We do know that when we knock it out from the respective animals, we find no destructive lesions in the presence of antibody. You can see here in a wild type animal, you have a nice destructive lesion. In the knockout animal, we no longer have 
any targeted destruction. Where do we find it in patients? I'm bringing this up is that, as you might expect for an MS oligoclonal band, this antibody is not readily apparent in the blood serum. And here you have both neat CSF as well as concentrated CSF, anti-human IgG shown in green, an intrinsic marker shown in red for expression of this antigen. And you can find that in the CSF, we have nice binding of this MS recombinant antibody to target cells. It is hard to detect in neat CSF and will require concentration uh, to find, but not too uh, surprising to us that this is necessary because when we look at relative concentrations of CSF to plasma, we find that roughly the antibody is about six-fold more concentrated in CSF than plasma in patients with multiple sclerosis. And the initial evaluations to date suggest, and I don't have time to go through this, that about 50% of all MS patients have this marker that we've analyzed to date, covering some broad spectrum of disease. And so, what are CSF MS oligoclonal bands? They're a polyclonal CSF immunoglobulin population that are synthesized in significant quantities in MSCSF. Electrophoresis is an old technique. It's very insensitive. And that this oligoclonal band population, as determined by its relationship to the CSF B cells that are antibody producing, are connected to an intrathecal B cell response that also circulates with the periphery and is either linked to or contributes to the inflammatory process driving disease. I've showed you with models, and we have direct evidence from patients of the correlation between the presence of these antibodies and the activity going on in MS patients. What are these targets? They're going to vary. There's going to be some that are pathogenically important, and there's going to be others that relate to a destructive process that may relate to other processes that drive different aspects of pathology, as well as some that may be B cells that are surviving in a relatively conducive environment to B cells, as mentioned in the prior, prior lecture, where we had diphtheria toxin B cells getting to the CSF and producing immunoglobulin, as well as the MRZ reaction that is used here in Europe for MS diagnosis that may point to a particular environment that's helpful for B cell production. They drive inflammation or are a product of this inflammatory response, and they do target neuronal and glial antigens. And I think coming soon, they're going to facilitate the diagnosis and the treatment of disease. And before I conclude, I'd like to thank uh, Greg Owens in particular, long-standing collaborators, worked tirelessly on this process. Alana Ritchie, a long-standing member of the lab. Etin Lulu, who did the uh, cell slice assays. Kevin Blau, who did the original spinal cord assay. Other members of the lab involved in the production. Current collaborators, Wendy Macklin and Catherine Given, who are working on the remyelination uh, and demyelination projects with us. Ethan Hughes, who has used the development of these antibodies uh, to develop a novel model of cortical demyelination in vivo using two photon microscopy collaborators on the NMO project, and of course, uh, my funding agencies. And I'd like to thank you all for your kind attention.